I had the privilege of going to Carrollton this week to a uh, Right Now Media conference, and we are part of that Right Now Media team. And if you haven't signed up for Right Now Media, if you would email the church uh, your email address, we would be able to sign you up. And there are thousands of videos, conferences, marriage tools, children's videos, opportunities for us to grow in our faith. Right Now Media is... Their main objective is to get the church rooted in the Word of God. Not just coming to church on Sunday morning, and they are so pro-church, but to learn and to grow. We had uh, some phenomenal speakers. And uh, I want to take, over the next couple weeks, some clips from the notes that I have taken from those conferences. And uh, when you're talking about this week, we're talking about, this is to the church. This is to the body of believers. And Paul gives us a prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 that is a phenomenal, phenomenal prayer that needs to be put into our church. And, and when we look at this prayer and we look at what he is trying to say to the church at Ephesus, he is pleading with them. He's saying, guys, do not let the, the, the lackadaisical lifestyle, do not let the engaging of our culture hinder the work of God. And he sits there, and there's a couple prayers in Ephesians, but the, the Ephesians chapter 3 prayer, it lasts about 40 seconds, and it is so awe-inspiring if you read it at face value. So I'm going to ask you to please stand to your feet. This prayer that Paul has given to us if we look at the words to this prayer, and we're going to dissect this, we're going to understand how we can become stronger in our faith. Verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through the spirit of the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints that is the width, the length, and the depth, and height. Now to the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. You may be seated. Sometimes we say a prayer and we get into our King James language and we do the these and the thous and we talk forever. And God really thinks that, you know what, he wants to not hear the words out of our mouth as much as he wants to see the heart within our life. And this is talking about the inner man. This talking about the real person within you, not what people see and not what you want people to think. They're talking about the inner man, the one deep within your soul. So I want to give you some points today about prayer. The first one is prayer is a membership matter. Prayer is a membership matter. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named says, for you, the church, Paul says, I bow my knee to God. You know, there's not a posture that the Bible says that we need to pray in. Whether we are prostrate in front of him or whether we stand in amazement of him. But the Bible does say one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Bowing our knee before God is a sense of humility and empowerment. That I am saying I allow God to take over my life. It is a membership into a church. It is a right that we have. That when we bow our knees before God, God listens. God cares. The church has one father. And that father is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a family thing. When somebody comes to your house and your child brings them to your house, they are accepted into your house. 
unless they do something stupid, then you kick them out. But when your child brings them into your house, they have free reign to come into your house. They even have free reign to go into your kitchen. If they're like my kids, they have free reign to open up the refrigerator and start grazing for 20 minutes, okay? Because your kids just graze. They don't just fix them. They just graze. They just well, might as well just take the hinges off the refrigerator, right? They just walk by, take this, go out, take that. They just graze all day long. But prayer is when somebody comes into the family, they have access to God. They have access to communicate, to talk. One of the neatest things when people come over to the house or when they, you go to somebody's house, when you just sit and you talk. You can learn a lot about somebody just by talking to them. And the more you talk to them, the more you see their heart, their desires, their ambitions within life. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do with us. He wants to put us into his family, his unit, so we can have people alongside us and we can pray with each other and carry each other's burdens. Bill Moyers was a special assistant to the president of Lyndon B. Johnson. He was asked to say grace before the family quarters in the White House. And Moyers began praying softly unto God. He became asking, asking God to bless the food and bless the president and bless the family. And Lyndon B. Johnson said, said, Mr. Moyers, you need to speak up. I cannot hear your prayer. And Mr. Moyers says, Mr. President, I was not addressing you. There's a higher power. And when we speak, we do not have to speak with loud lips. We have to speak with a quiet heart. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, now how good it is to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? When you look at prayers of membership, when we pray, the house of God is called the house of prayer. It is a place where the church offers up their prayers before God. And when we offer up our prayers before God, God wants to look at our prayers, look at our heart, and he wants to give to us the very desires of our heart. But after that first verse, it gets harder because now he's trying to put some conditions on that. What do I need to do? In verse 16, it says, well, that's the, the prayer is a power producer. Prayer is a power producer in verse 16 that we would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. See, there's two parts of man. There's the outer man, the flesh, the body, and we work very diligently to keep the outer man healthy and we care what people think about our outer man. But if our inner man was as healthy as our outer man in most cases, we'd be very spiritual. But unfortunately, if our outer man was as healthy as our inner man, we would be very weak. We must put focus on the inner man, our spiritual condition. If you find yourself in difficult situations, we must pray. Lord, strengthen me powerfully by the Holy Spirit's power. I need to be strengthened. You know, the inner man gives a strength. The outer man causes us to fail. See, the flesh and the spirit, they war against each other. They war against each other in many different areas and many different times. And Paul has given us an illustration in Romans chapter 7, and then he turns around and he answers the problem in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 21. If you would, I want you to listen to this. It says, and I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Now, can we all relate to that? We do that. On natural occasions, when we live in the flesh, we live by sight, we try to fix things ourselves, we find ourselves wanting to do something, but we find ourselves doing something else. We desire to do good, but even though I desire to do good, sometimes I do bad. But here's the top of the matter. In Romans chapter eight, verses two through four, and because you belong to him, 
The power of the living, giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared in it to send control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this to that we just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follows the spirit. When you see what Jesus did in the flesh, we fail. The law could not be upheld. We broke that law. We broke his commandments every day. And God said the law could not fulfill the righteousness. I have to send Jesus. And because of his perfect lamb of God, he is going to take away the sins of the world. He's going to fulfill all righteousness and fulfill all the law. In the flesh, we fail, but in the spirit, we have power to succeed. Life is a matter of decisions we make. Where you go, and the power to succeed in those decisions. I can imagine this one verse, and it's probably the most popular verse other than John chapter 3, verse 16, is Philippians chapter 4, 13. Well, a lot of people have that tattooed on their arm, and it says this, I can do all things through Christ who th strengthens me. But let's look at that setting. In a prison, chained to a guard, ready for death, Miserable, starving, but he loved his Lord. And he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not, I can win a ball game because Christ is going to be with me. No, I'm going to endure the punishment of prison, of the beatings, of the senseless acts. I can endure that because I love my Lord. I can do all things. I can go through all things with Christ who strengthens me. Paul prayed three times to take away his weakness. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And he accepted that grace that God has given to him. I understand your weaknesses. I want to give that to you. Now, the third point is prayer is an eye opener. Prayer is an eye opener. There's a couple words here that I think is very important that we need to pay attention to. In verse 17, it says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints that is the width and the length and the depth and the height. The word dwell is a word that means uh, a guest in a house. Uh, that Jesus is coming over to dwell with you. It's not salvation because we're already saved because he's already talking to the church. He's talking about those that have already given their life to Jesus. Now he's saying, he's saying that Christ may live, freely live within your life. The problem with our anemic church world today is we want to visit Jesus at his house, but we don't want him to come to our house. Because if he comes to our house, things may have to change. We wouldn't want that on the table, and sometimes our house is dirty, and sometimes there's things that maybe we do not want Jesus to see. And If Christ moves into your home, you need to give him full access to your home. If he dwells, if he freely dwells within your house, within your heart, within your life, to have fullness, to comprehend the grace, to have access to God, he must be able to say, you are my Lord and Savior. Lord means preeminent one. He has total access. He ought to be able to come to every place within your house, within your heart, and within your life. But I believe the first place he would go would be to the library. And he would go to your mind. He would look at what you are filling our mind with. Are we putting the proper things in the mind of his head? Are we reading the things that God would have you read? Are we putting the word of God properly in the place that if we dwell on the things of God, 
We can, we can take out the sin within our life. We can renew our mind daily by the very washing of the word of God. I believe the library is where he needs to go because it all starts up in the head and then it goes to the dining room. He would ask you, let me see what your appetite is like. Now, I don't think he cares about what we eat in our physical life, but he wants to see what our appetite is like in our flesh. What is it that you crave? What is it that you long for? What is it that you'll sacrifice for? The dining room is so important because it talks about the appetites within our life. And if Jesus moves into your house, he's going to go into the library, and then he's going to go into the dining room, he's going to look at the appetites, and we need to give our appetites to Christ because our appetites of sin will never be satisfied in the flesh. They can only be satisfied when we give them to Christ. And then he's going to move from the dining room to the living room, and that's the people you hang with, the conversations that you have. You know, the conversations and the people are very important. If we want to be a powerful, loving, godly church as an individual, we must surround ourselves with people that are going to elevate and lift us up and not tear us down. But I do believe, although there's going to be people that, that we need to lift up, that's gonna be below us, that, that we're going to encourage them to give their life to Jesus and, and to be around them just like Jesus did. He was around the sinners and the publicans. He was around people that needed Christ. He was not afraid to be with them but he also hung with people that could encourage him, that could pray with him, that he could encourage himself. People you hang with limit us or they could help us. And then I believe he goes out to the garage or goes out to the workshop. And he sees the skills and the talents that you have. Whether the skills and the talents are used for the glory of God or the skills and the talents are used for self-ambition. Because when he takes over your house, when he comes in and dwells within your house, every part of your house is his. So he looks at the workshop and he looks at your skills and he looks at your talents and he's asking a simple question. Is this for me or is this for you? Because anything that is yours is not his. Mine. This is my time. The Bible says that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that Christ may live within your heart. He may take up residence within your life. And then from the garage, there's a little door. And Jesus starts walking over to that door, and that door is dark. And that door has a stench. And Jesus covers his nose. And he says, what's behind that door? He said, Jesus, I've given you access to the library, to the dining room, the living room. I've given you access to the workshop. But that closet, can't do it. And Jesus says, if I'm going to dwell, I have access to everything. And that dwelling point means open doors. And if we, as the body of Christ, want to understand how we can have the riches according to his grace, full of mercy, we have to have total access to Christ, and he has to have total access to us. And that closet is that closet of unforgiveness, of hurting, of the scars, of the things that you ignore and the things that you hold on to. Jesus says, I need in that closet. That closet is a closet that you have put away, you've locked up, you've never allowed anybody in that closet, but Jesus says, I dwell here. This is not your house. Your house has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's been paid for. You're not your own. You're Christ. That's my closet. That is my life. That is my library. That is my living room. That is my dining room. I dwell in you. And if you want any of the power that I can give to you, allow me to dwell and take over. Christ can't control the inner man until we allow him to clean the house. He can't give you the power. Hey, let, let's, I'm going to fast forward this. But it's probably not a good idea, but I'm doing it. You know, it's a bad idea when you, something comes to the spur of your moment. But uh, turn to chapter, tw or, uh, chapter 3, verse 20 real quick. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. 
The only way that God is going to answer and give us the thing, the power to give to us the very desires of our heart is if we allow the power to take residence within our home and then the power that works in us will do it through us. But we can never take verse 20. We'll never be able to live out verse 20 unless we allow him to take over and dwell within our house. We will not be able to comprehend what God can do unless we allow him to take over our house. It is a priority. We have to feel comfortable with Christ. Verse 18, be able to comprehend with all the saints that is the width, the length, the depth, and the height of his love. The width. He'll go to the ends of the world, separate you as far as the east is from the west from your sins. The length, he'll go for an eternity to be with you. The depth, he said he's gonna bury your sins in the depths of the sea. There's nothing that he will not do to draw you to him. And the heights is heaven. He wants to be with you. He wants to encompass every aspect of your life. He wants to show you what his true love is. And the Bible says all the saints and the width and the length and the depth and the height, we cannot comprehend God's love. But until we do that, we will not be rooted and grounded in love. One of the basic attributes of God is love. God is love. That's one of the attributes that he has. And he said, he said in this, to be rooted and grounded in love. Not in doctrine, not in the church, not in the pastor, or not in your personality, and not in your resources. To be completely satisfied in Christ is we have to understand God loves me. Loves me. Even if you think you're unlovable, we have to comprehend the height, the width, the depth, and the length of Christ's love. We have heard over and over and over and over again that somebody says, well, I'm not lovable, or nobody will do this, or nobody will love me. What we must do is we must understand that absolutely Christ loves us. Love is a byproduct of the inner man knowing what Christ has done. When we know what Christ has done, this is to the church. This is the body of believers. When you know that you were a sinner and you know that you were going to hell and you know that there was no way that you could get to heaven on your own and you gave your life to Christ, you bowed your knee to him, you asked him to forgive you of your sins, he showed you grace, mercy, and love. There is nothing that he asked in our behalf. He just shows you and says, now this, you shall know your disciple if you have love one for another. We should take the very attributes that God has given to us and give it to others. And then number four, prayer is a filler upper. Prayer is a filler upper. Don't you love pulling up the gas station and putting gas in your car? Don't you just love that? 25, 30 bucks, 45 bucks, 50 bucks. And it seems like it's every other day you're just filling the gas tank up and, and it's like, oh, just throwing money away, throwing money away. It's a non-ending project is just putting gas in your car. Well, prayer is not a non-ending action. It is a forever action. Verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the height, the length, and the depth to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. To understand love is something that's uncomprehendable. Knowledge cannot tell you how much God loves you. The Bible even says to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You do not, we cannot comprehend through words. The only thing that we can comprehend love is is through action. When love is a verb, love is action, we comprehend what love is, and God is saying, I want to give to you pure love, whole love, action love. I want to give to you salvation. I want to give to you grace. I want to give to you forgiveness. I want to give to you the things that no one else could ever give to you. Nobody else could give to you what I'm offering to you. You can't even comprehend it. 
that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The more we pray, the more we will feel the coming, the, the filling coming into our lives. Let's look at three verses, verses 16, 17, and 19. Verse 16, filled with the Spirit, that he would grace you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Filled with Christ, in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The triune Godhead is in these three verses. The Spirit of God, the, the, the resident God within our heart that when Jesus left this earth and he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came and rested into the whole souls and the heart of every believer. It is God within us and the rest of Jesus, Jesus being part of the, of the redemption plan of God, says that, in, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, knowing what he said, knowing his action, knowing that he died on the cross for our sins, changes everything about us. And God, the Father, the creator of the world, says this, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's not any one of us in our physical bodies right now that will be able to handle and even comprehend the triune Godhead, what God is truly like. But when we take off this mortal body and we are in the presence of God in our incorruptible bodies, we are gonna be able to experience the very power of God, the fullness of God. We'll be able to see God. We can't even recognize him now. Sometimes we don't even know if he exists. Sometimes we don't feel the Holy Spirit within our life. We do not have the fullness of God. But if we can experience these things and allow God to work within our life and pray and ask God to work diligently, then the one of the attributes of the fullness of God is the fruit of the Spirit. Ask yourself this question. Am I full of the Holy Spirit? Do I have the Holy Spirit within my life? And I would answer that question for you if you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior and you believe that he died on the cross and he rose again and he ascended back in heaven. Yes, you do have the Holy Spirit of God within your life. He is in resident within your life. He is a resident within your soul. And these are the attributes in Galatians chapter five. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, peace, joy, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I look at that and I say, I need a whole lot more of God within my life. I look at that and I said, I, I, maybe a couple times a day I have a couple of those. But it seems like I look at that list and I fail every day. And that's why the Bible tells us that we need to die to ourselves daily that it's an everyday occurrence that we cannot do this on our own. And number five is prayer is for God's glory. Prayer is for God's glory. There's two words at the end of this verse that goofs this whole verse up for me. I understand that God can do all these things. But when it says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power I could accept that. I could do anything. I would never try to put God in a box and say that God can't do this. God could call down and he could do whatever he wants. But when it ends, that works in us. We can't get verse 20 until we get 14 through 19. And when we get 14 through 19 and we understand that prayer is the priority and if we are rooted in Christ and we understand that Christ wants to take residence within our life and there's nothing that I am not willing to give to Christ, when we ask God anything, he has the power to fulfill the request that I have. Whether it is your finances, whether it is your relationships, whether it is your sin, your addictions, your problems of life, if we are not willing to give it to God, it's in a closet, and we say, do not, I will not, it is mine, you cannot have it, and then we say, why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why don't we listen to what he asks? If you give your heart, your soul, 
to me, let me dwell. Take up residence within your life. I can give you verse 20. But if you won't let me have the residence and dwell within your home and take ownership of the home, why should I give to you the thing that you'll do for yourself? Because verse 21, it says, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus of all generations forever and ever. The only prayer, listen to this, you can pray all the prayers you want, but God will only answer the prayers that he gets glory through. So you pray for somebody, it's not about you. You pray for somebody's healing, it's about giving God the glory when he gets healed. You ask God to do something for you, how can I use it to glorify God? You ask God to give you something, how can I use it to glorify God? God wants to get the glory in everything that you ask for, and when he gives it to you, verse 21, to him be glory to the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever God uses his son Jesus to redeem mankind, to glorify the church and the members of the church when we are his residents, when we allow him to take over our life. Everything that we do should honor to Christ. When we talk, when we sing, when we preach, when we joke, whatever we do, it should be to honor Christ. The power of the Godhead working through us. Uh, let's look at that verse. And it's okay if I would say, the power that works in us, or according to the power that works in us. All that I can think according to the power that works within us. All that I could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Above all that I could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Abundantly above all that I can think or ask according to the power that works within us. And this is exceedingly, abundantly above all that I could ask or think according to the power that works within us. You know where the power is? The power is on our knees. Paul said this, I bow on my knees before God. And I ask the church to be real, to allow the church, to allow the Christians not to be anemic, not to play the game of church, but allow God to do great and mighty things, something you can't think about, you can't even imagine, but God wants to do it through you and for you, and all you have to do is ask, and he can do it through you, in you, in the inner man. And you say, well, he never answers my prayers. I've asked a lot of things, and I've really never seen God do a miraculous work within my life. Well, let's back up a couple steps. And let's ask God to show you the truth. And the truth is very simple. When we put God where he needs to be, in verse 14, Paul bowed his knees before God. And he just says, I want to pray for the saints of the church that you are the head. You are the Lord. You are the Savior of the church. Everything that the church does and the church boiled down is you. Everything that you do should bring glory and honor to Christ. Is your marriage bringing glory and honor to Christ? Is your job bringing glory and honor to Christ? Is your resources bring glory and honor to Christ? Are your talents bringing glory and honor to Christ? to Christ. If you want God to bless, to do things above anything that you could ask, think, or even imagine, give them over. To be rooted in Christ. Rooted means a seed planted in the ground. The seed going into that ground and taking root. The winds can come and it'll blow that little seedling around. But once it's rooted, it's not going to go anywhere. And it stays in the ground for a short time. But once it sprouts, the taller the tree goes, the deeper the roots go. And once the roots go deep within the ground, it's fixed. It's solid. And the Bible in Ephesians chapter 3 is saying, guys, the church 
You need to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. When things do not go your way, go back to how much God loves you. When things fall apart, you're rooted and grounded in love. When things do not go the way you want it to go, you're rooted and grounded in love. Forgiveness, grace, mercy, they're all attributes that God wants us to use. They're very difficult. But when we can give God his glory, he can use our failings and others' failings in order to bring his glory. It's sometimes very difficult. And you know what the Bible says? I love this part. When one soul comes to know Christ, you know what's happening in heaven right now? The Bible says the angels of heaven are standing and rejoicing and praising God for the one soul that entered into heaven. Last week, Shirley had the privilege of leading a, a lady to the Lord down here at the altar. And although we were going, leaving, we were being dismissed, we were talking, we were doing the, the physical thing of leaving church. But all around the spiritual world, the saints and the heavens, the angels were around the throne, around this auditorium, and the saint that was just now born again was celebrated. The angels of heaven were celebrating and bringing glory to God for one soul that was cast from Satan's family into God's family. They rejoice. Celebration. When we can celebrate the way the angels celebrate, we can get on our knees and we can thank God for what he has done. We can praise God. The wind, the hurts, the pains, the problems, they are never going to go away in your life if you do not put God rooted within your life. Deja vu. Deja vu. Every day. Every year. Every issue. If we do not make the changes that we need to make and put God where he needs to be deep rooted within our life, we will quit, we'll give up, and the deja vu will happen over and over and over again. We're going to get mad at God. We're going to walk away from the church. We're going to walk away from the very things of God. And God is saying, I'm right here. But we're not rooted in him. We do not understand his love. So we get mad because he, in your eyes, has not done what he said he would do. And he is saying, I just want to dwell with you. I just want to love you. I want to show you what I have. I want to give to you my love, my mercy, my grace, and my forgiveness. But you are pushing me away. You're not allowing me to do it. If you would just surrender, bow and accept, allow him to be the Lord of your life, then everything changes. Are you needing to change? You know, I heard um, Jerry Falwell preach one time, and he said this at the invitation. I love this statement. He said this in his prayer. If you're not satisfied where you are spiritually. You're the only person that can make the move. Your wife can't make the move for you. Your parents can't make the move for you. Your husband can't make the move for you. If you are not happy where you are spiritually, you are the only person that can make the move. And you can't blame God, and you can't blame the pastor, and you can't blame others. The only person that you can give your heart and your life to is Jesus. And he's not making you. He's inviting you to. Is there a problem? Is there a need? Are you not satisfied where you are spiritually? Have you even given your life to Christ? Today's a great day to plant your seed of faith into the ground, or the fertile ground of Jesus and allow him to water it and allow the seeds to take root and to grow and prosper and to take a tree that God wants to build you into that can do great and mighty things for the cause of Christ. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we do thank you for your power. And Lord, we know that you're able to do exceedingly above anything that we could ask or think according to your dynamite, your power. And Lord, you even said you could do it in us. So Lord, I pray that you will just allow us the ability to search our hearts the inner man, and allow that 
inner man to take over. Allow that inner man that wants to be the godly influence, the one that wants to honor you, bow our knees before you, listen to our hearts, listen to our lives, take over our problems, fix us because we need to be rooted in you. Lord, thank you. And be with us as we investigate the inner soul, the inner man. You can't love us anymore. We can't accept you any quicker. We need you now to change us and to love us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Would you please stand to your feet and maybe you're, maybe you come to church here, maybe you don't. But the opportunity for an invitation is just this, for you to talk to God. We ask you to come to the altar. Maybe there's something that you're struggling with. Maybe there's issues that you've hidden. Maybe it's in the closet that stinketh. Maybe it's a talent or a treasure that you're not willing to give. Maybe it's in the dining room, living room, or even in the library. The Bible says Jesus wants to dwell. He wants to take up residency. When he comes into your house, can he get into the front door? Can he open every door? Is the heart, your mind, and your soul clean? If not, allow him to help you clean it. You can't do it on your own, but you can do it with his help. And he will be with you today in order to make that take place.